Something familiar, something peculiar, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Something appealing, something appalling, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Nothing for kings, nothing for crowns, bring on the lovers, liars and clowns. Oh, situations, new complications, nothing portentous or polite. I am going to introduce the next person who will be starting this. This person walked on fire, ran a successful advertising business for over 20 years. This person is a professional manager that manages the day-to-day -day activities of her daughter, household, and workout every day. This person is a speaker, trainer, and creative inspirer. Please welcome our contest chair for the Humorous Speech Contest, Distinguished Toastmaster, Stephanie Koa Kawa. Welcome, Toastmasters. Are you ready to get some muscles going for this humorous contest? Get your muscles. of introducing our contest chair. He is the winner of all four contests. In 2011, he won the evaluation contest. 2012, he won the international speech contest along with table topics. That's a feat. 2015, the humorous contest, and 2015, the table topics contest. He is the owner of the Gem Hunter, a gemological storytelling service. The Jedi Master himself and everyone's superhero. Let's welcome Barry Vincent. Thank you, Stephanie and everyone. It is always so good to come back here. I feel like it's family. And I really appreciate everyone who has been in my life. Toastmasters is a huge part of my life and has truly changed my life. And as the contest chair, the first thing that I need to do is make sure that everybody's in the right place. Not just in the building, but your spirit and mind is in the right place. Because, for those of you who have guessed, there are four contests in Toastmasters. There's the humorous, sorry, there's the evaluation contest. And let's give it up to Garrett Gray as our 2015 evaluation champion. There's the table topics contest, where you have two minutes and 30 seconds to speak extemporaneously kind of like I'm doing right now. <laughs> then there's the International Speech Contest, where one person gets a chance to stand in front of the whole entire world and tell their story. Let me give it up to my brother and fellow Jedi, Eric Feigenegger, as the 2015 <laughs> District International Speech Contest. <laughs> so there's table topics, Evaluation, International Speech Contest, and then there's this. The Humorous Speech Contest. This is the one, ladies and gentlemen, this is the hardest one. I think you know that I've been here a few times and I can say with not a doubt in my mind that it took me five years to stand on this stage. 
Because in the humorous speech contest, not only do you have to give a speech, but you have seven minutes and 30 seconds to make people laugh. And some of you are saying, oh, Barry, that's easy. There's no problem. Okay, I got a challenge for you. Gentlemen, the next time you're in trouble with your woman, the next time, I'm not talking about a little bit of trouble, I'm talking about where you've been cold busted doing something that you wasn't supposed to do and your girl told you a thousand times not to do it. I challenge you to look her in the eye, stand there for seven minutes and 30 seconds, make her laugh. If you don't get thrown out of the house or beat up, you know you made it. Ladies, the next time you decide that you want to get the garage painted or you want to clean up the house on the same day of the game, the game that he talked about for the last two weeks, go ahead. Make him laugh. That should be easy for you. See, because nothing has really changed since the last time I've been on this stage. As I told you then, and I'll tell you again, it's hard. So hard to be a superhero, especially if you have to make people laugh. So ladies and gentlemen and guests, welcome to the 2015 Humorous Speech Contest. Let's go. First thing I need to make sure that everyone does do is to tear off all your devices, your smartphones, your tablets. Please keep your flash photography to a minimum or really don't do it at all other than our professional photographer because we do have lighting issues here. Okay, today we have the humorous speech contest. Contestants, this is always interesting. You, you kind of wing it as you're going. When the contest has concluded, we will have a 10 minute break, and after that break, we will, now there we are already in the contest. Okay, contestants, timers, ballot counters, sergeant at arms have all been briefed prior to the beginning of this contest. Everyone is aware of the Toastmaster international rules that govern this contest. No one should enter or leave the room during the contest presentations. You may do so if time permits during the minute of silence between the presentations. Is everyone clear on that? Yes. No potty, I work with kids, so no potty breaks or anything like that. <laughs> I'm just gonna take a second to enjoy this because I teach middle school where orcs and goblins and trolls still exist. So the fact that I have 100, 200 people sitting here quietly listening to me this is heaven. <laughs> Thank you. So without any further ado, oh, let's get ready to rumble! Our first contestant, Jerry Evans. Heads up. Line up, please. Say again. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. The speaking order. It's been a while, folks. Thank you. To be a superhero. Or a distinguished toastmaster. Speaking order. First contestant. Jerry Evans. Jerry Evans, our first contestant. Second contestant, Stephen Fru. Stephen Fru. Our third contestant, Jessica Walden. Jessica Walden, our third contestant. Our fourth contestant, Jill Morgenthal, Colonel Jill Morgenthal.
This is where it gets interesting. Our fifth contestant, Vidas Vidya Spinibas. Sinivasa. They have the same problems in school. Oh, it's amazing. They're student number five until about six months into it. Our sixth contestant, Fatima? Fatima. Fatima. There you go. Nice. Nias. That's what I said. Fatima Nias. That's our sixth contestant. Our seventh contestant, Betty Jagabusi. Jagabusi. The New York part of me, I got that. Jagabusi, our seventh contestant. Our eighth contestant, Mark Groves. Mark Groves. And our ninth and final contestant, Stephen Matea. Stephen Matea, our ninth contestant. Contest begin. Our first contestant, Jerry Evans. Heads up. Our first contestant, heads up, Jerry Evans. Everywhere, every day, walking aimlessly with a violence blank look on your face. These zombie like creatures that you observe and witness every single day of your life. They walk aimlessly, their heads buried up their handheld assets, so intoxicated they can't see straight. And you wonder what are we becoming? Are we becoming a nation of hyper connected hermits? Thumbing fiercely on our smartphone? Really? Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmaster, fellow humans. The word that immediately flashes through my mind is zombies. It's like the show, The Walking Dead, which used to be some of those people primarily human, but not anymore. I now find my eyes scanning swarms of people to see how many of them are staring at and no. Answer, just about all of them. Now I realize that fads come and go, but every once in a while, even Pac-Man and Mario faded in the background of fun and games. Now I have a hard time picturing when the handheld will be replaced by the next big thing. The handheld is different. With its shiny surfaces, it's sleek, satisfying, and sensual to the touch. It's mysteries and air of sophistication. It gives one a sense of empowerment. To hold it in one's grip is an exhilarating macho experience, Ruth, even for women. <laughs> the handheld enraptures people in a way I've never before seen, whereas video games, they can be stressful after all. Right? The handheld has a tranquilizing effect. Handhelds are to teenagers and adults what pacifiers are to infants. But perhaps the most amazing thing about the handheld is that, and I still haven't figured out exactly how it accomplishes this, it seems to level the playing field. It turns virtually everyone on the planet, from Wall Street wizards to minimum wage fast food workers into geniuses who knew, right? 
No matter what one's intelligence or station in life, he or she can find the nearest Chinese restaurant. Get an answer to any whimsical tabletop question. Or get the directions to a Toastmasters club anywhere within seconds. Other than Hillary Clinton's emails or Trump's presidential campaign, what else could people possibly need to keep them contented? Am I right? <laughs> so at the current pace of handheld technological advancement, it seems inevitable that these little digital somas will soon have a chokehold on every human brain. Did you know that there are more new handhelds activated every single day than new babies born? Can you believe it? Any average person on the planet looks at his or her phone 150 times a day or about once every six minutes. I'd call that an addiction, wouldn't you? But the worst plague and growing fear sweeping the world today is nomophobia. All of you could be suffering from nomophobia and not even know it. Do you know this word, nomophobia? The term is an abbreviation for no mobile phone phobia, or no mobile FOMO for short, or simply SSA, Smartphone Separation Anxiety. <laughs> the fear and sheer terror of being without a mobile device are beyond mobile phone contact. Now people tend to be a little anxious when they lose their mobile phones, run out of battery or credit, or have no network coverage. But here's what's really startling. Among high school and college students, it's on the rise. An increasing number of college students now shower with their cell phone. <laughs> now I wonder, do they use virtual cell soap or virtual cell body wash? Is there an app for that? <laughs> and the average adolescent teenager would rather lose a pinky finger than a cell phone. Can that be right? And a growing percentage text or tweet instead of actually talking to others. Talk about nonverbal communication. I'm sure none of you do this, though. Do you know some people even take the thing to the bathroom so they can talk while they sit on the throne? <laughs> now, I'm sorry. This is just wrong. But not for hygienic reasons, as you all suspect. About a month ago, me and a Toastmaster friend of mine, we went to Wendy's for lunch. Now, I went into the bathroom to wash my hands before I ate. About a minute later, he walks in talking to his mother on the phone. And he proceeds to walk into the stall, still talking to his mother. And I look over and I'm thinking, I just hope he's not taking a selfie or drops his phone in the toilet because it'll void the warranty on his phone. They keep people occupied 24 hours a day. Without question, they become the new opiate of the masses. You don't have to snort it or shoot it. You can stream it to get your fix. But perhaps one good thing that could come from the handheld zombie trance is that there will be less time for people to engage in rioting, crimes, and other antisocial behavior. Besides, who has time to commit crimes when you have to check your handheld every few minutes? One can only help but wonder whether or not the nature of the Big Bang predestined that mankind would soon become a giant nation of handheld zombies. So utterly mesmerized that they would lose interest in all the other mind-dulling activities that have surrounded them for decades. Is it possible that fun addicts will lose interest in college and pro sports, reality television, and rioting over imaginary grievances? Friends, fellow humans, Lend me your attention. One thing is now certain. The zombieization of humankind is now upon us. One can only begin to envision where it will be five years from now, ten years from now, twenty-five years from now. So the next time you have a close encounter with one of these zombie-like creatures, with their heads up, their handheld assets, so intoxicated they can't see straight, I want you to shock them, shake them, wake them up from their handheld trance, and I want you to scream, say it with me, heads up! <laughs> say it again, heads up! Mr. Toastmaster.
Thank you. Timer, may I have one minute on the clock, please? Thank you, Timer. Our next contestant, contestant number two, Stephen Frew. An ocean of emotion. An ocean of emotion, Stephen Frew. Yes. Do you remember sophomore year in high school? Please raise your hand. Surely I do too. My English teacher was Mrs. Johnson. We were studying literary symbolism using Arthur Miller's play, Death of a Salesman. It's about Willie Lowman, a mediocre salesman who cheats on his wife and dies at the end. But before he does, his wife gives a famous speech. My husband is not a successful man, nor a perfect man, but he lives a valuable life. Attention, attention must be paid to such a person. <coughs> Class, who can tell us the literary symbolism of the name Willie Lowman? I raised my hand. Yes, Stephen. Willie Lowman, Lowman on the totem pole. Who would pay any attention to that guy? He's a loser. Yes, <coughs> my best friend Big Tom leaned over and whispered, good one. <laughs> Stephen, how would you like to give a speech about this play in two weeks? <gasps> yes, Mrs. Johnson. Oh no, I was petrified by public speaking. Big Tom leaned over and whispered, who's the loser now? <laughs> the two weeks inched by. My preparation consisted of worrying about how I would fail. The big day came. I was called to the front of the class. Everybody was staring at me. I froze. I was drowning in an ocean of emotion. And that wasn't the sea of love. <laughs> I went back to my seat and sat down. Based on that miserable failure, what career did I choose? Lawyer. <laughs> I must have been a masochist. Every time I spoke in public, an ocean of terror rose up within me. Finally, after many years, I signed up for a lawyer's continuing education course in public speaking. I paid hundreds of dollars, and the single best piece of advice they gave me was, join Toastmasters. <laughs> Much cheaper. <laughs> Table topics. I dip my little toe in the ocean of jitters. Not too bad, I signed up for the contest. First stop, area, no opponent. This is easy. <laughs> Next stop, division. Wow, big crowd. I introduced myself to the other candidates. Hi, I'm Steve Fru, Steve Fru, Steve Fru. Hello, I'm Prez Vesela. <laughs> I wasn't impressed. He has an accent. Nobody will understand him. I can guess how that theory served me. 
this year. Bill asked if I'd like to consider the international speech contest, and I said, sure, but oh no, at the club level, I was out. Bill said there was another club looking for a contestant, but I was back in again. <laughs> On the division. On, oh, or beyond the area. No opponent again. I'm getting pretty good at this. <laughs> On the division. Now the tide came in from the ocean of clammy sweat. Oh, oh, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat breakfast. All day at work, I literally sweated through my clothes. The contest came. I drew number six. I was going to have to wait. The young lady who drew number four got one minute into her speech and froze. Just like I had in high school. The clock ticked by. The room was dead silent. Her plight was so heartrending, I said a silent prayer. Oh, dear God, please, please, please. Don't let that happen to me! <laughs> and by the way, please help her too. <laughs> I guess he did, and she was a Toastmaster. She snapped out of it, she finished with a flourish, and I thought, wow, if she can do that, I can do okay. And I did, I lost, but I came in second, and the next day the winner announced she was unable to go to district. So I was a second place finisher, I was going to district <clears throat> without ever having won a contest. <laughs> Uh, the time came in from the ocean of cold feet. Oh, I thought I must get control of these emotions, but how, how, how? Ocean, water, faucet! My condo building has 50 flights of stairs. Up the stairs, working my imaginary faucet down to the basement to practice my speech. Up and down, up and down. The big day came and I woke up from sleep. I had actually slept. I ate breakfast, I went to the contest, I performed as practiced, maybe a little bit better. And I lost. I had tied for fourth, but I had jet skied on the ocean of exhilaration. What was it about Toastmasters that gave me that victory? There was the sunshine of support and encouragement. There was the gentle rain of constructive criticism that slowly started filling within me an ocean of confidence. What a weird feeling. <laughs> what a wonderful feeling. Let's revisit Death of a Salesman. Willie has just listened to his wife's big speech. Yes, dear, thank you. He walks out the front door and heads for a bar. But on the way, he passes a Toastmasters banner. Curious. He looks in. Hello, welcome, come on in, I'm our Vice President of Membership, Iqbal, coming at ya, at ya! <laughs> Would you like a brownie? <laughs> sure! <laughs> Mrs. Johnson, Big Tom, fellow Toastmasters, have no fear, with Willie and Toastmasters, there will be no death of a salesman, but there will be a life of a salesman. Willie will change his name to Willie Jaime. <laughs> and attention, attention will finally be paid. Mr. Toastmaster. And I'm telling you, I have a minute of silence for the judges to mark the ballot.
Thank you, Thomas. Our next contestant, Jessica Walden. Who would tell lies on the internet? <laughs> Who would tell lies on the internet? Jessica Walden. Thank you, fellow Toastmasters. I'm hoping you can help me this afternoon because I'm struggling with something. And if you laugh at all during the next five to seven minutes, I think I'll have my answer because this device this device that Jerry rightly pointed out made me a zombie? I used it to tell a lie on the internet today. I checked in on Facebook, and I was going to the District 30 conference, and I checked in home. It wasn't such a big lie, but Facebook really forces me to lie, because all of those friends that I accept, well, if Facebook had a category for frenemy, <laughs> my list would be a lot longer. But Facebook is wonderful. It's helping me document my niece and nephew, their childhood. We went to the zoo a couple of days ago, and uh, you know what it taught me? That that moment where you get all of them lined up, and everyone's nice and neat and clean, and no one has cried yet, that moment's priceless. So I took that picture and I posted it on Facebook, and we looked so serene and happy, and I had zero guilt because I didn't take pictures of me feeding them sugar and then taking them home. <laughs> Facebook only got that, oh, auntie loves you so much, because if I had posted every time somebody cried, yelled, or screamed, my phone would have lost power. <laughs> but Facebook is the one place where, you know, you do some creative truth telling, but where the creative lies really come out, that's online dating. <laughs> now, I'm not too proud to say that I photoshopped those last 10 pounds off. <laughs> that doesn't do that, right? But, the contortions that I have to go through to get a good selfie and headshot, that's where I think the artistry really happens with the online bots, right? They should just call it OK Catfish. <laughs> but online dating, if I could just tell my height and weight in the metric system, that would really help me out because nobody knows metric. Right? I mean, I would feel so much better about, oh, my weight is still in two digits. That is fantastic. The fact that it's kilograms, well, that's the fine point. If anyone is on the internet, they should be putting that data into a converter anyway. But the one place where I hold rigorous attention to detail, where I am my honest, truest self, that's LinkedIn, right? Yes, I'm very honest. I make sure that I connect with lots of people that I have no intention of working with again. <laughs> I make sure I know exactly where those former colleagues are working so that I don't put in my application. <laughs> I'm not too proud. That's one of the best uses of LinkedIn. <laughs> Another thing, LinkedIn has really taught me with the perspective of time and distance that, you know that job that you take when you're young and hungry? When you're like, oh, I'm going to get my foot through the door. It's going to be awesome. And then you find out, wow, this commute? Oh, it's really long and unpleasant. I'm just in stop and go traffic all day. That job where your boss tells you to do one thing and then yells at you for doing the thing? Yeah, that job. Because of course, that's the job where your coworkers, they come to work every day like they are not there to make friends. That's the job I have on LinkedIn. And you know, I typed up what I did there and it looks like the most wonderful growth experience. And it's technically true, right? 
But LinkedIn, that's, that's a tough site because you can tell when people look at your profile. You know my favorite part about LinkedIn? I can see when my ex-boyfriends look at me. <laughs> this is why we're not friends on Facebook anymore, because I want to know. And I'm always gratified to see them changing up jobs, so I can avoid those companies too. <laughs> but the internet is, you know, it's a wonderful tool. I love it. It helps me show my best self. I mean, my mom is friends with me on Facebook. I am definitely sending my ambassador to that site. But I've been very lucky. I haven't been caught in lies too often. I've even had a few dates, I swear. It's been a lot of fun. And if any of you would like to connect with me on LinkedIn, because I clearly don't have a future as a public speaker, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Coastmaster. Thank you. Time we may have a minute of silence while the judges mark the ballots. Our next speaker, Jill Malgathal. The Rub, a true story. The Rub, a true story, Jill Malgathal. I was all of 22 years old, I joined the army. I was a Cold War warrior! <laughs> How cool is that? I also had a top secret clearance. And if I told you any more, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> no, no, seriously, I'd have to kill you. And I remember when the sergeant sat me down, he said, Lieutenant Morgenthaler, now that the army has cleared you, you must understand that the Army has the right to say yes or no to who you marry. <coughs> what? Oh, don't get your skivvies in a bunch. We just don't want you marrying a Chinese spy or a Syrian terrorist. You can have one night stands. <laughs> have you cleared that with my dad? <laughs> So my first assignment was in South Korea. I was stationed up along the demilitarized zone, the DMZ. We're watching the enemy. The enemy's watching us. It is so boring. There is no action at all. Well, that's not true. There is action. When the American soldiers will go into the village and get massages, they come back with these big smiles because they had gotten the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> and one day my girlfriend Kay, Kay was older than me, more experienced. She'd already been married and divorced. One day Kay said to me, Jill, let's go in a village and get us one of those massages. I said, Kay, I'm not risking my top secret clearance for a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. She goes, Jill, the army doesn't care about massages. They just care about marriage. And I said, Kay, my mother taught me that marriage comes before massage. <laughs> and she goes, Jill, get over it. So I got over it. We went to the village. The women there were really shocked to see two Western women walk in. 
I went into a room, got undressed, laid down on my belly, had a sheet over me. Young lady came in, started to massage me. Hurry up! Hurry up! <laughs> really, man? You pay for this? <laughs> and at one point, the daughter of Bruce Lee <laughs> left the room. And I thought, well, maybe I'm supposed to turn over. So I thought, yeah. <laughs> I move the sheet, frontal view, she walks in and screams. I look down, yeah, I'm all here. But I am now traumatized. I swear, never again, never have a massage again. Never say never. So, I was transferred to West Germany. Kay came to visit me. I was so excited to see her. Kay, I'm in love. I've met a wonderful guy, Danny. He's an American soldier. And I think he's going to propose to me any day now. Ah, Jill, that's wonderful. I need to get you a pre-engagement gift. Let's go get a massage. <laughs> okay. Ah, Jill, the young lady just didn't know what to do with a woman's body. A lot like my ex-husband. <laughs> over it. We went down to the massage parlor. A beautiful man stepped out. Hey ladies, you know Dwight Johnson, The Rock? Yeah, yeah hubba hubba. <laughs> this man made Dwight Johnson, The Rock, look like the Pillsbury Doble. <laughs> yeah. And then he said the best thing I have ever heard in my life. He said, you? OMG! I had no idea Jill could sound so sexy in my life. And I said, yeah. So I went in, and he said, you? I am Mohammed. And I looked at him and I thought, oh, oh Mohammed, come to the mountains. <laughs> the massage was fantastic. Shortly afterwards, Kay left, and Danny sat me down. I thought, Ooh, he's going to propose. I'm going to say yes. The Army's going to say yes, because he's not a Chinese spy or a Syrian terrorist. And then baby will go to Sweden and get his and her massages. <laughs> yes, Danny? Jill? I'm breaking up. Oh. oh. I fall in love with my masseuse, Mimi. <laughs> Can't beat that wink wink nudge nudge. So, after a few weeks of hurting, I thought, Jill, get over it. Go back to Muhammad and get a massage. Bring the mountains to Muhammad. <laughs> so I put on this tight black leather skirt. Yeah, my red lipstick. I was hot. I was sexy. I was sizzling. <laughs> or maybe not. When I walked into the massage parlor, the receptionist went, Stop! We're not hiring. <laughs> Mohammed came out and Jean, come on in. He had me lie down my back, sheet over me, and he started to massage my ankles. And he says, Jean, what's up? Well, Mohammed, I'm actually leaving Germany to go to grad school. He starts massaging my calves. And where is your grad school? California. He starts to massage my thighs. How would you like a massage every day? <laughs> what? And then he starts to massage up near my um, <clears throat> DMZ. <laughs> he says, you, marry me. Take me to California. I'm looking at this drop-dead gorgeous man. Oh my gosh, a massage every day for the rest of my life. Oh, baby! And then somewhere in my reptilian brain, an alarm went off. Warning, warning, top secret clearance. And I looked at Muhammad and I said, Muhammad, where are you from? Syria. Syria! <laughs> oh, God. Syria. And then, in that 
I did the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I said, no! <laughs> oh, the sacrifices I have made for my nation. <laughs> Master Toastmaster. Silence so the judges can have time to mark the ballots. Thank you, Timers. Our next contestant, Vidya Spinavasa. The day when everything went wrong. The day when everything went wrong, Vidya Spinavasa. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters and friends. The day started like this. I was on vacation and there was a beautiful forest near the place I stayed. It was an early morning, so I decided to take a walk in the forest. The entire place was mystic. The sun rose gradually, giving a glorious greeting to the mountains, which seemed to move away from me as I walked. There were gigantic trees all over, with different colors on their leaves, as the sunshine swept over them slowly. The morning mist was very cold, yet relaxing. I could feel the crisp smell of cold soil, wet dew and herbal aroma which was rejuvenating and refreshing. I walked and walked and it brought me to a waterfall. Not a huge one. I didn't know where it originated from or where it descended to. There were small rocks by the side. So I sat on one of them. The water was crystal clear and tasted sweet. Nature at her best. I dipped my legs into the water and treated myself to a natural pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, I thought I heard a growl. I turned back and saw nothing. Must have been the rumbling of trees. I heard the growl again, this time much louder. I was not alone. I turned back and there was this huge creature standing before me and it growled louder when it saw me. I at once knew that I had to run. I ran, ran as fast as I could. But I didn't know what this creature was. It was as big as a dinosaur. But I know dinosaurs don't exist. <laughs> but was there a last dinosaur hiding in this forest all these years? <laughs> Whatever it was, it was not a friendly animal and I had to run. I ran as, as fast as I could. I saw a huge fleet of stairs and a rope tied to something at the top. I could have easily taken the stairs, but I chose the hard way. I clinged myself to the rope and climbed up with great difficulty. The creature had gone up there before I did. Must have taken the stairs. <laughs> Suddenly, I was in a highway. What was going on? Whatever it was, the creature was still chasing me and I continued running. I ran into one of the crossroads and there was this huge truck speeding towards me on one side and this dinosaur-like animal on the other side. I was horrified. I jumped off the bed, ran to the living room. My mom heard the... My mom heard the noise. She came to the hall. She made me regain consciousness and she made me realize that I had a bad dream. <laughs> it was 4 o'clock in the morning. I went back to the bed and didn't sleep. I've had a worse nightmare. And they say early morning dreams come true. <laughs> was it trying to tell me something? That was the time I finished college and waiting for my work assignment. So you can imagine how bored I would have been. 
I wanted to get my name in the voters list, so I had to go to a government school to fill up a form. That was the only agenda that I had for the day. What would possibly go wrong? I looked for my bike keys, but couldn't find it. The dream stuck to me once again. Maybe it was lost for a reason. The school was just one mile away, so I decided to walk. Now that was the first time I went to the school. There were small classrooms on one side, a huge barren ground in the middle, and a dilapidated house with an unused car parked outside on the other side. I figured that room to be the office room where they issued the forms. I started walking in the ground towards the office room. As I walked, I saw three dogs staring at me. One of them got up slowly. I pretended not to notice them, although I was shivering from the inside. I turned back and saw them. One of them was following me. The show was over. The dogs knew that I was scared and I at once had to run. They came towards me with ferociousness in their eyes. I ran, this time for real. My dream came true, I thought as I ran. They say barking dogs seldom bite because they cannot bark and bite at the same time. <laughs> but I had three dogs in front of me. One was doing the barking job. <laughs> one was trying to sharpen its canine to pounce on me. And one was trying to corner me. I ran fast and stumbled into the mud water. The dog stopped instantly as if waiting for me to get up. I got up and started running and they continued chasing. I went and I went and hid myself behind the car, the unused car where they couldn't see me. But dogs are great at sniffing. They easily found me out. All this running and hiding and chasing had provoked them and they were not going back without seeing flesh. The dilapidated room was my only choice. Thank God it had a door. I went inside and locked myself in. What a momentary relief. The dogs were barking and asking me to come out. I took a quick look at the room. It was full of debris. Some office room, I thought. Classes were going on in full swing, although I couldn't hear anything. Suddenly, I found myself shouting, help, help, somebody save me. Like in the movies where the frail, covered heroine hopelessly shouts for help. But I caught the attention of a little boy inside the classroom. I called at him, I signaled at him and waved at him, but the poor boy was caught by his teacher for having his attention outside of the classroom. The teacher made him change the place and there went my last hope. I was now horrified. It was more than 10 minutes since I am locked up in this room. Dogs were not barking anymore because they knew that I had to come out anyway. <laughs> I waited for someone to pass by. I chanted all the holy hymns that I had learnt in my life. Even the holy hymns where I asked the God to make me educated and disciplined because I was running out of holy hymns. <laughs> After 20 minutes, my prayers were answered. There was a small boy who walked past the building. I called out to him and he saw me. He came and effortlessly shooed away the dogs. They even wagged their tails at him. They knew each other very well, I thought. I came out and thanked him from the bottom of my heart. He said they were harmless, but not for me. I asked him to take me to the other side of the building and he did so. My hands trembled as I filled the form. After half an hour, I was at home, still not recovered from the shop. I went, I, I opened the refrigerator to get a cold drink to find my bike keys inside. I wanted to laugh and cry at the same time. That night I ate, prayed and slept, hoping the next day would be a better day. Thank you. Thank you. Time is my have a minute of silence for the judges to mark their ballots.
Thank you, Times. Our next contestant, Fatima, Fatima, yes. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Fatima, yes. No, trust me, it was. Let me give you a few examples and I will show. When I was six years old, my mother decided to volunteer for our class's Halloween project. She came for our party and I begged her, Mom, please, can't you let someone else volunteer this time? She shooed me off and said, oh, come on, it's going to be great. And plus, I've already thought of my costume. I rolled my eyes and sighed. I'm sure you have. The day of the party had finally arrived. And as I sat at my desk, all I can think of is my mom is about to come through that door. What are my friends going to think of me? As she approached the door to swing it open, I slumped further and further in my chair. In came my mother. She is a woman whose stature is five foot one on her tippy toes. And she came in with this enormous sun hat that covered her entire face. And as she flipped back that sun hat, it gave way to this ridiculously large pair of pink sunglasses. <laughs> As she walked through the door, she said, Hey, anyone want to go to the beach? <laughs> As the entire class started laughing, all I could think is, well, at least she didn't wear her bathing suit. <laughs> <laughs> but then I saw the rest of her costume. She was wearing one of those long shirts with the print of a curvaceous woman in a bikini. She even tied a grass skirt around her waist. And through the day walked around, anyone want to do the hula? <laughs> Lunchtime was soon to approach. And I thought, they are going to let me have it. As I went to the lunchroom, food in hand, I sat down at my table, and all of my classmates came around me. One by one, they were saying, your mom is so cool. She's so much fun. I wish my mom was like that. So I told them, you want her? You can have her. Now, the embarrassment didn't stop there. When I was eight years old, we learned about puberty in school. I was terrified. What in the world was about to happen to me? 
as I walked home in the door, my mother looked at me, noticing something was wrong, and asked me, Fatima, what happened? Tell me about school today. I proceeded to tell her everything we learned in school. And then I asked her, Mom, when do you think I'm going to start puberty? She said, oh, Fatima, don't worry about it. It'll be like 10 or 11. 10 or 11? My head was spinning. I ran upstairs and tried to do my homework. But I couldn't concentrate. 10 or 11. 10 or 11. As the evening progressed, I finally walked up to my mom. Mom, don't you think we should be going to the store? She looked at me confused. Fatima, what are you talking about? It's late. You should be going to bed. You've got school tomorrow. By now I was angry. Mom, you told me I was going to start puberty at 10 or 11. It's 9.45. pulled out her notebook and proceeded to dial everyone she's ever known. It was then I realized she didn't mean 10 or 11 p.m. And it wasn't called family product. For months she had so much material on me. She told everyone, even every female cashier she came across heard the story. I thought I would never live that down. Finally, I'm 16. I was driving. I passed my driver's license test after the second try. And my mom allowed me to drive everywhere I could. When we ran to the store this day, we decided to go and get a few things. She recalled she forgot something. It was body wash. So as we walked down the aisle to the body wash, I happened to know a very handsome young man who was standing there. And as my mom saw the product, she reached down to grab it, and as she did, it happened. The sound that you wouldn't believe. As Obi-Wan Kenobi once said, there was a great disturbance in the forest. But <laughs> no, what was that sound that was echoing over the walls? It was my mom and she farted! How could you? I ran as fast as I could out that door and got in the car. But not before she said to me, Fatima! <laughs> And it does look like it's going to be a particular busy day. And maybe even a little sunny. Better <laughs> <laughs> be prepared, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you. Timers might have a minute of silence for the judges to have time to fill out their ballots.
Thank you, Thomas. Our next contestant, Betty Jacobusi. New life with the retired spouse. New life with the retired spouse, Betty Jacobusi. Conjure up in your head. Now the Toastmaster is the most welcome guest. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Toastmasters, I want you to know that my husband retired, and most people say, okay, you may be at 65, I'll retire. I said, are you ready, honey? He goes, not yet. 75? Not yet. My husband retired at 84. <laughs> and so here we are. 84 years old, and he's retired. Now, we've had 59 years of married life. At this point. Now, I'm going to tell you, for 59 years, every day for 59 years, 5 o'clock in the morning, I gave him his lunch, he went off to work. 5 o'clock at night, 5.30, he had dinner. I had 12 hours all to myself. <laughs> but what do you think I was doing? Six kids? Lots of things to do. There's bookkeeping, there's parent-teachers meetings, there's going off to the stores, there's keeping house, there's running the whole gamut. Plus, my social life. I'm an art teacher. I was having classes. I was doing all kinds of wonderful things. And so I'm thinking, hmm, he came home, and tells me that he's retired. Now, we did it on a Friday, so Saturday and Sunday was no big thing. We always get together on Saturday. Sunday, Monday, I'm an early riser. We share the same bed. Look where I'm going. Whoa, he's still here. <laughs> Not bad in bed. Very quiet. Did my little errands. Went over to church. I like to go to church in the morning. Threw a load of clothes in the washing machine. Did all this stuff. I was outside running some some other things that I had to do out there. And I walked in the house and here, he's up. I'm going, oh, 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 good morning. He said, did you sleep? Oh, I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, he says to me, what's for breakfast? I'm going, I ate two hours ago. <laughs> but I didn't say that to him. That was only what's up here. It was coming out of my mouth. He said, oh, honey, what would you like? He goes, I'll have it. <laughs> How about an egg over light? Some rye toast and a cup of coffee? I said, no problem. I made it for him. He's sitting there eating, and while he's eating, he goes, what's the lunch? I'm like, whoa. Oh, dear. It's a whole new program. I go, you know, it doesn't always work, because sometimes I have meetings, and I don't come home right away when I'm off to church, and I have to do things. And I said, you might have to do this on your own. And besides, I just have a social life of my own that we have to talk about. I do think. We, we, we just can't always connect together. And besides, you know when you retired, they took your car, so we only have one car. It's mine. So That's no problem at all. He says, I'll get you a bus schedule. I'm going, yeah, like in school. You're going to sign it out, you're going to bring it in, and I'm going to tell you where I'm going. So, you know what? Something's wrong with this picture. And I said, right now, I have to go shopping. He said, I'll go with you. I said, honey, I'm going to Kohl's and I'm going to get some underwear. He said, that's okay. I said, I'll meet you in the men's department in flannel shirts. He follows me at the lingerie. And I even concentrate. I'm thinking, where is he? What is he doing? I looked over at the Maneria sitting with a big smile on his face by a naked mana mannequin with all the underwear next to him. I'm going home. <laughs> you know what? This is not working, honey. But I didn't tell him that. He said, did you find what you wanted? I said, no, not yet. Maybe I'll be back in three weeks. <laughs> so then we got home. And I said, you know, you have to have a job. You have to do something. Because what you're telling me and what I'm doing for you is like having company and you're not going home. <laughs> so, and all of a sudden, he looked at me, I said, what are you doing? He said, he had a bucket of water with a scrub brush, some cloth. 
plot and ranks and what are you doing? He says, I'm going to give you a break. I'm taking over housekeeping. <laughs> How do you know how to do that? He says, oh, I know how to do that. I do it on my hands and knees. I'm going to wash the bathroom upstairs, the one on the first floor, and I'm going to do your... I said, really? I told my friends, and <laughs> they went to hire them. Yeah. So I said, you know what? That's not a bad idea, but I tell you right now, we do have to get another car. He says, well, we'll talk about that. I said, you know what? That's code. They speak to you in code. That means if she doesn't say anything and I don't say anything, it'll go away. Not this time. <laughs> I said, I have to go and I have to see two people I'm mentoring for the Toastmasters, and I also have to meet up another lady who was just home from the hospital. I said, I'll be out for a couple hours. I did. I went out and ran my errands. I came back two hours later, and he met me at the door. And he says, where were you? I said, I was in Alaska watching the salmon spawn. <laughs> I'll go to the grocery store with you. I'm like, oi, oi, oi. Yes, you can go to the grocery store with me and find out how much things cost now, like they didn't cost 59 years ago. But what happens, just the same thing with that little clipper that changed the television, he takes over with the car. Then he's running the car all over the store like this. He was like going on the Dan Ryan's with the car. And there I am with all these groceries. I'm like, where is he? Timers. Our next contestant, Mark Groves. I've had better days. I've had better days, Mark Groves. Mr. Toastmaster, my fellow Toastmasters and welcome guests. Some years ago, I was driving to work in my new blue Honda. I was wearing my brand new dark blue suit with matching shirt and tie. I worked in human resources and safety at a distribution center. When I arrived at the office up on the second floor, I noticed someone had bought donuts. It was Friday. Things were looking good. So I grabbed a donut. And I'm munching on my donut, I'm talking to people, just munching away. But I had to go downstairs and follow up on some new employees. As I was leaving the office, I noticed some of the staff members giving me strange looks. 
In fact, when I was down on the work area, I was again getting these strange looks from various people. I returned to my office, sat down on my desk, when the operations manager popped his head in the doorway, gave me another strange look, and said, Mark, we have a visitor here from OSHA. <laughs> OSHA! The Occupational Safety and Health Administration Act of 1970 under the auspices of the Department of Labor. Eek! <laughs> Immediately, rivulets of sweat began pouring down from my brow, into my palms, and unfortunately seeping into the armpits of my new blue suit. The blood drained from my face, and I took on the appearance of a well-dressed snowman with red hair. <laughs> The operations manager looked at me and said, Are you sick? You don't look good. I lowered my head and before I could respond, I heard the voice of the plant maintenance manager who said, Mark, we have an OSHA inspector here. Angrily, I raised my voice and I said, I know the stupid OSHA inspector's here. And as I raised my head, standing next to the maintenance manager was the stupid OSHA inspector. <laughs> The ocean inspector was a tall, thin, expressionless gentleman wearing a black suit, a white shirt, a black tie, and a thin black briefcase suspended off his left wrist. And I'm certain that Holly would copy that style for the men in black. <laughs> and it was at this point, while being rather nervous and sweating profusely, that I couldn't put words into their proper sequence when speaking. I offered the ocean inspector my sweaty palm and it said, I'm Human Resources from Mark Groves. <laughs> he was following up on a ventilation complaint. We identified the area in the building, and we went down to that area to check it out. As we approached the area, I noticed that the supervisor in that area was smoking a cigarette next to a vehicle with a flammable liquid placard on it. I hung back from the ocean inspector and went like this, told the guy to get rid of the cigarette. He misinterpreted my gestures and with the cigarette out of the corner of his mouth, waved a friendly greeting back to me. I introduced the ocean inspector to the supervisor, and the supervisor looked at me and said, Hey Mark, how's that cocaine habit of yours working out? I was speechless, and before I could respond, he said, Are you sick? You don't look good. I said, sick I not am. I sounded like Yoda from Star Wars. The supervisor took me aside, and he asked me to look at the front of my suit coat. Now I knew why everybody was giving me these strange looks. Earlier, I had grabbed a powder donut, and along with my sauna sweating, this is the way I look. <laughs> the inspector finished his interviews and his observations, and as we're walking back to the office, I noticed someone had taken a 12-foot A-frame ladder, placed it on top of an 8-foot storage shed, and there's a pair of feet on it. And the ladder is swaying. It's rocking back and forth like this. I had no idea the Chinese acrobats were in the building. <laughs> but it's not. It's the maintenance manager. He's checking a vent in the ceiling. And he's standing on the top of the ladder. Not the last rung, but the very top of the ladder with his feet covering the sign required by OSHA that says, this is not a step. <laughs> Buzzers are placed throughout the building to indicate, in the ceilings, to indicate lunch break. There was a buzzer in the area where the maintenance manager was. Oh, no. It was break time. It went off. This startled the maintenance manager and he fell off the ladder and plummeted on top of the storage shed with a thundering boom. A cloud of dust settled upon him. He's laying there and he looks up, he sees me and the ocean inspector, and with a crooked smile he says, I'm okay! And he reaches into his back pocket, pulls out his handkerchief to stem the flow of blood from the cut on his forehead. The ocean inspector looked at me, slowly turned to me, 
a faint smile on his lips, and with just a touch of cynicism said, Are you sick? You don't look good. <laughs> we had a wrap-up meeting, and I'm escorting the inspector out to the parking lot, and here's an employee driving like a maniac, swings around a row of cars, sees the ocean inspector, swerves, barely missing him, and smashes into a parked car. My new blue. <laughs> I tell you, I've had better days. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you. Time room, I have a minute of silence so the judges have time to mark their ballots. Thank you, Timers. Our final contestant, Steve Mateo, a man on a mission. A man on a mission, Stephen Mateo. Fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, contest chair, and judges, I am a man on a mission. You see, it has been my mission as a homeowner to take on every little home improvement job in my house. I'm going 10 rounds with a faucet and sink replacement, to getting down and dirty and wrestling with a toilet bowl, to installing a ceiling fan. I've been that guy. I've been that man on that mission. So it came as quite a surprise one morning when my wife called me down to the basement and there were some old steel pipes that had begun to leak. She pointed to him and said, what can we do about this? Seeing opportunity as a man on a mission, I was ready to jump in on it when she said the one thing that was like a stake through my heart. She said, let's call a plumber. <laughs> a plumber? That we the pay? Are you insane? Of course, the last thing I said in my head well, she looked and said, who else are we going to call? Opportunity. Honey, I'm your guy. I'm a man on a mission. But she responded, you're a man on what? <laughs> never mind, never mind. It's pipes. It's simple. You take the old pipes off, you put the new pipes on, bada bing, bada boom, the job's done. <laughs> she wasn't convinced. And she looked at me and said, You've done this before? <laughs> well, not really, I responded. I've seen YouTube videos and this old house. It's plumbing. How hard could it be? She still wasn't convinced. She said, you know, you don't know what you're doing here. You could end up flooding the basement. Honey, please. It's me. Trust me. I'm not going to flood the basement. What's the worst that could happen? She wasn't convinced, but she had had enough of this argument, so she went upstairs. Now, I knew I was on the clock. I had to get this job done. So that day, I went out and bought all my pipes, and I planned the next morning to start the job. And that following morning, picking up my equipment bag, I headed down the stairs to the basement. I went step by step by step. And when I was in the basement, the silence of the basement was broken by the pipes that were taunting me to the sound of drip, drip, drip. So I carried my equipment bag and I walked over to the pipes and I stared them down 
It was man versus pipe. It was go time. So as I put down my equipment bag, I stared at the job. For the right job, you need the right pipe wrench. So I reached in my pipe wrench, and I pulled out, not the right wrench. <laughs> so I reached in a second time, and I pulled out, once again, not the right pipe wrench. No, I went in one more time, and this time, ladies and gentlemen, for a job this big, it's not just any pipe wrench will work, you need the Terminator of all pipe wrenches! <laughs> and I was ready, and I clamped on that pipe, as I started to open that pipe up. There was a gnawing feeling that I was forgetting about something. But I kept going ahead, and I kept working on it. But still, there was something I was forgetting. And then the question came to me, as I was working on it, I did shut the water off in this pipe, right? and I got my answer on a crank of the next wrench. Water sprayed into my face, all over me, all over my hair. I was drenched in a second. And next thing I knew, I was looking down at the ground, it looked like a mini Niagara Falls was taking place at my feet. I panicked. My wife was right. I was going to flood the basement. What was I going to do? What was I going to do? I said, it's easy, Steve. You're a man on a mission. What would a man on a mission do? I thought about it. I gotta shut the water off. <laughs> and I cranked that valve off. Ladies and gentlemen, I was beat. I was exhausted. I was soaking wet. I needed a break. So like every job, you have a helper. In my case, it was my equipment bag. So I went in my equipment bag, and I reached in for plumber's helper number one. And it was the Advil. <laughs> but I knew I needed something stronger. Yes, I needed the help. Plumber's helper number two. <laughs> oh yes, plumber's helper number two was just what I needed. The two of us decided to take a little break. <laughs> now, after our break was done, feeling much happier, I returned to the job. As I took the old pipes off and put the new ones on, a sense of confidence overcame me. Could I begin this right? Could it be done? But I knew my true test was waiting when I had to turn that water belt back on. Now with all the confidence and faith in what I had just done, I walked over to that valve and as bravely I opened the valve up, much to my surprise, the water flowing through the pipes peacefully. Could I have gotten this right? Uh, but that was broken by the sound of drip, 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 drip. One of the pipes began to leak, so I grabbed my pipe wrench. I started to clamp down on that wrench. But as soon as I saw another leak, I clamped down on that one. I began to tighten that pipe as well. Then I looked. I had a drip to my left, drip to my right. If my wife was there, she'd probably say the biggest drip was holding the pipe wrench. But it didn't stop me. No, no. I kept going left, right, left, right. I had become a deranged man on a mission. I had to keep going. I lost all track of time. Minutes, hours, days, seasons felt like they passed by. But I kept going left, right, left, right, tightening everything. And as soon as it started, I stopped. Peaceful. No more trips. Victorious. I ran upstairs to celebrate with my family. But nobody was home. <laughs> but as a man on a mission, don't let that discourage you. For your true enjoyment is accomplishing the job and hopefully getting it right. So in closing, my fellow Toastmasters, I hope my speech today has encouraged you to take on the next home improvement job. Now you may get bruised, you may get cut, you may even bleed, but don't be discouraged. Those are badges of courage. Now join in me in saying, I am that man! I am that woman! And I am on a mission! Thank you. Everyone, please remain silent for the judges to complete their ballots. And once the ballots have been collected by the vote counters.
join Toastmasters and volunteer for a variety of reasons. Ethel, Iqbal, and Barbara know how to put on a party. <laughs> when I saw the bottle down there, I was like, for me, thank you. I'll come back any day. But let's give a rounding applause for our contestants. And have them all come up in the order that you perform today.
We had a whole Broadway production planned for you, but Stephanie told me to cut it short. So please just let us know how long how long you've been in Toastmasters. What is your what club are you representing, and what is your Toastmaster education level? Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just celebrated my seventh year in Toastmasters. Today I'm representing. Palatine Toastmasters Club number 3307, but I'd also like to give a shout out to my other three clubs, and I'm a DTM. Hello, I'm Steve Frew. I've been in Toastmasters three and a half years. I'm representing Successfully Speaking here today. I'm also a member of Loop Trustmasters, and I'm Advanced Grunt. My name is Jessica Walden. I am representing Blue Cross Blue Shield Club 1752928, and I am a competent communicator, and my protege has to give one speech, and then I'll get my CEO. Hi, I'm Jill Morgenthaler. I've been a Toastmaster for 24 years, wow. and I'm still learning, and I am a member of Windy City 5283, and I'm a advanced bronze, and a competent leader. I am Vidya Srinivasan. I've been a Toastmaster for over two years in the past and two months now with uh, Chicago Speakeasy. <laughs> and uh, I'm a competent communicator too. Again, my name is Fatima Niaz. I started Toastmasters this past July, and I successfully just completed my 10th speech. I'm Betty Jacobuffy, um, with the Park Ridge B81 Club, and I've been at Toastmasters for 10 years, and I'm working on my goal. My name is Mark Groves. I am affiliated with Speakers of the House 7906 in quaint and scenic Riverwoods, Illinois. And I am uh, bronze on both levels. Hi, my name is Steve Matea. I've been a Toastmaster for just over eight years. I'm with the Oakland Toastmasters. I'm also a CCCL. I'm with the Oakland Toastmasters Club 872531. You can put on the board! Yes! Let's get them all Are you 
say that there were two disqualifications. Oh. Our second place winner, drum roll. And the announcement that everybody is waiting for. Our first place winner for the humorous contest for District 30, Betty Jacobowski. Thank you.